Okay. Uh, so, hi again <laughs> and welcome. This is um, the opening session of a research project funded by the Portuguese Foundation for Science and Technology and hosted by the Institute of, of Philosophy of the Nova University of Lisbon. The uh, project title is uh, Mary Brenda Hesse's New Epistemology, Principles and Legacy. It started in, in January 2022 and will, will um, run for uh, 18 months. The aim of the project is to explore uh, all the aspects that should be considered in order to provide a comprehensive account of Mary Hesse's view and especially her legacy. The latter including the impact and influence her ideas have on the ongoing debate on scientific realism and on the issue of scientific modeling. Uh, today, I will briefly outline Mary Hess's epistemological conception by focusing on the elements that I find most stimulating for the aim of the project. So my, my aim is to provide a brief overview in order to see which are the elements that are more significant and uh, that can be used in order to uh, uh, make uh, has a dialogue with, with contemporary uh, issues. Mary Hesse uh, provided us, uh, we can, uh, 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 let's start with this, I'm sorry, uh, uh, for who uh, is not familiar with, with Hesse, Hesse, um, is a philosopher of science who worked uh, in London, in Leeds, and in Cambridge, uh, first as a lecturer in mathematics and in history and uh, philosophy of science. And then she became professor of philosophy of science in Cambridge, where she also uh, been a professor emerita uh, after, after, uh, uh, after since, since 1986. Uh, very briefly, we can consider as relevant issues of her research uh, interest, uh, the issue of uh, models in science, the uh, topics of analogies and metaphors, also in, in science, of course, and the uh, broader question, broader problem of uh, finitism, which can be compared with the um, Edinburgh School uh, finitism is, can be more or less defined as the idea that natural scientific inference has rational grounds, but these are essentially finite and local in application. The meaning of a concept changes when those grounds change. This is the uh, broader, broader idea. Uh, we can sum up uh, SS research uh, with reference to these um, ideas. First, a rejection of most of the presupposition of positivist philosophy of science, the logical and the analytical style included. This is um, a topic that is uh, interesting also if we consider the, the, the history of uh, analytical philosophy. Uh, second, we have a development of a network, a model of science, which has been also called the Hessenet, according to which all scientific predicates are to be understood in the context of a low informed network. And references uh, for these are especially uh, the works of Duhem and Quine. Also, we find in Hesse um, the defense of a modified or a moderate uh, realist account of scientific knowledge, a much more dynamic or flexible interpretation of science and scientific knowledge, of course, based on the sociological discussion of epistemology. And here we have, uh, we can um, find two uh, main frameworks. On the one hand, Marx and Durkheim. Uh, on the other hand, we have the work of Quine, Kuhn, Feyerabend, and of course, uh, Wittgenstein as references of, of uh, Hesse's work. So elaborating of this, um, I would like to uh, present some uh, more detailed 
uh, some more details on, on Hesse's view. <clears throat> Hesse uh, provided us with an original and interesting view of the scope and value of scientific knowledge. Inspired by the way in which the premises of what she calls the standard empiricist account, including the assumption of naive realism, universal scientific language, and uh, the idea of uh, the correspondence theory of truth. Um, inspired by the way in which these premises have been undermined by several authors from the philosophical tradition, including Duhem, Quine, Kuhn, and Feyerabend, Hesse developed an alternative view of theoretical explanation focused on the metaphorical value of scientific knowledge. Furthermore, Hesse maintains that we owe not to overlook the modeling role played by the observer in ordinary scientific inquiry. And consequently, she argues that the very relationship between our theories and the object they describe is much more complex than one might think. And the confidence that has a believed standard empiricists gave to the descriptive and explanatory power of the language of science is untenable. <clears throat> more precisely, Hesse calls for a reconsideration of the picture of science and the world, according to which there is an external world which can in principle be exhaustively described in language. And science is an ideally linguistic system in which true propositions are in one-to-one -one relation to facts. <clears throat> Has it developed this apparent radical form of anti-empiricism in an original way, however. In fact, she does not maintain that strong anti-realism must be defended, but rather, she tries to stress the actual value and function of language in science. It focuses on how it provides us with an access to the natural world that, uh, that while not literally accurate, still depends on an independent world structure. That we might say that an unconventional, or has a time, form of empiricism is preserved. Hesse's view on this issue is first expressed in her early writings and then developed throughout her career. For example, in a 1958 paper, she maintains that the dictionary theory, according to which there is some set of phenomenal statements whose truth or falsity is known directly by observation, and then contrasted with this, another set of theoretical statements, the meaning of which is dependent upon a dictionary which translates some of them into phenomenal statements, simply cannot accommodate the problem raised, for example, by quantum theory. The dictionary theory, as it continues, has been adopted firstly to contrast the clarity and certainty of empirical tests with the tentative nature of theories, and secondly, to show, nevertheless, how theories could, uh, could be unambiguously tested and hence given meaning by experiment and so distinguished from speculative metaphysics for which no such tests were available. For Hesse, however, <clears throat> if phenomenal statements are to, be, uh, are to be tests of theories, then their meaning cannot be entirely independent of that of the theories, and consequently the function of the dictionary has been misconceived. The actual problem that Hesse has in mind is the classic riddle about the boundaries of observability. What can be properly defined as observable and unobservable in science? How are these two realms related? What is the actual aim of scientific theories or the proper meaning of scientific explanation? As it tries to answer this question by arguing that a confusion has been perpetuated by some writers in physics about the notion of unobservable entities. For the very use by physicists of the word observable, factual, objective, physically significant has been contrasted to such phrases as mental conceptions, fictitious entities, and mathematical equipment. This view is the product of a classic conception of science that would seem to place undue confidence in sense perception, thus radically separating phenomenal data and theoretical elaborations. For Hesse, 
The difficulties that follow from his presupposition, from this presupposition, have been tentatively solved by philosophers and scientists of an empiricist persuasion through instrumentalism, that is, by interpreting scientific theories which go beyond immediate experience as mere tools for correlating and predicting the result of possible experiments, but not as description of physical reality. That may have worked in the age of Newtonian science and in 19th century physics, argues Esse, but in 20th century physics, the word observable has become a technical term of quantum theory and the misleading equation between unobservable entities and theoretical, as opposed to phenomenal concepts, is currently untenable. In plain language, this, mean, this means that it is currently quite difficult not to consider the actual explanatory function of theoretical models that describe events that are not directly observable by us. The contraposition between purely theoretical versus phenomenal statements corresponding to indirect versus direct or literal representations of natural events simply does not stand as recent attempts to preserve attenuated forms of realism in science based on either fictionalism or perspectivism show. Hess's view on this issue is more oriented towards stressing the theoretical component of any observation statement than toward the empirical relevance of theories. By this, I mean that Hesse argues that the phenomenalist contraposition between mental conceptions and facts is untenable. Insofar as in 20th century physics, she writes, all observation for the purpose of testing a theory involves some interpretation. And the interpretive report of an experiment may be given in theoretical terms. Accordingly, a redefinition of words such as fact, observable, actual, real, and objective is required in light of a new conception that accepts that this, the distinction between theoretical and phenomenal statement does not call for translation, but for interpretation of observation at different interpretive levels involving more or less reference to theoretical concepts. That is to say, a, a dictionary theory presupposing a direct and univocal relationship between theory and facts is no longer satisfactory. Instead, one should conceive of observations as theory laden, as a product of a kind of theoretical activity that does not necessarily build facts, but rather participates in the process of scientific discovery. <clears throat> the new epistemology that has subsequently elaborates in an attempt to develop this early consideration, uh, focuses on such concepts as hypothesis, analogy, model, and metaphor. Thus stressing the constructive and interpretive role of the scientist who attempts to make sense of world events and organize them in a coherent system of efficient predictions, thereby preserving an objective report of the fact explored. The constructivist view that Hesse elaborates in her later writings constitutes the basis of a critical elaboration of the empiricist conceptual, conception of scientific knowledge. We find interesting observations on this issue in um, a book, a collection of papers uh, published in 1986 with uh, Arbib, the construction of reality, uh, especially uh, in, in this book, we find interesting issues, uh, interesting observations regarding the relationship between theories and facts. In this uh, text, a captivating image of science is outlined, one that is uh, explicitly contrasted with the traditional conception, which believes, although moderately, in the explicatory power of what can be viewed as the most concept, uh, complex and highly developed expression of human knowledge. For Hesse, science is constructive of new facts with no fixed body of facts possibly awaiting explanations. And the development of su uh, successful theories determines the constant extension of the range of phenomena that exist to be 
described and explained. This means that further work on the system of theories adopted is constant, constantly needed, and the value of that system can be assessed in light of its explanatory power with regard to the new facts encountered. Most importantly, this view of science implies that the facts themselves are theory laden. There is no representation of facts without the observation language and no observation language is just given as theory free. Hence, the very object of scientific explanation is not as literally definable as it may seem. Even within a relatively stable range of inquiry, the constructive character of our observation determines that the facts explored by science cannot be described as directly as the ordinary correspondence theory supposes. As a further remarks that the attempt to represent the word in knowledge as a neutral, independent object is not like a mirror image, rather it is a projection on the world of a mental model whose framework is given by schemes of kinesthetic activity and by the categories of language. Nevertheless, she continues, this projection of a constructed world model is not arbitrary, nor does it mean that the objectified nature is unconnected with objective reality. This picture presupposes essential interaction between the knowing subject and the world, whose actual existence is never questioned. In fact, it is on this interaction that Hesse develops her own demarcation criterion by arguing that a key difference between science and other kinds of world interpretation is that the constructed models provided by scientific theories are constrained by feedback loops involving experimentation in the natural world. This means that the constructive activity of science is constantly tested against nature and that the actual agreement between theory and facts is a matter of the feedback the tested hypothesis receives from the latter. It is worth noting that this picture allows us to preserve some sort of objectivity in science, which has the attempts to reconceive and redefine on a new basis. Now, allow me to sum up what has been argued thus far. For Hesse, there is an external world independent of human beings and their knowledge. Any observational statement is a construction of the image of the world that we know, explore, and try to explain through scientific theory. The natural world is constructed in a complex feedback process in which theoretical models and sensory input are assimilated and accommodated in self-modifying sequence of prediction and tests. Therefore, facts are theory laden insofar as they cannot be explained independently of the inquiry of which they are part, while at the same time, scientific objectivity is preserved by three, for our construction is constantly tested again the external world. world. And finally, the theory of knowledge as uh, constructions determines a new epistemology, which combines coherence and correspondence criteria of truth and dissolves the barriers between objective science and non-science, just as there is a continuum between literal and metaphorical meanings, so we do not posit a sharp dichotomy between the natural sciences on the one hand and social or literary hermeneutical sciences on the other, writes Hesse. This last point, the relationship between uh, natural sciences and social or uh, hermeneutical sciences requires further exploration in light of two papers <coughs> that are included in um, a 1980 collection, uh, Revolution and Reconstructions in the Philosophy of Science. Uh, this book explores how the turn from logical models to historical models in empiricist philosophy of science has undermined several of the premises upon, upon which the standard empiricist account depended, writes 
Hesse, and the most important of these premises are the assumptions of naive realism, of a universal scientific language, and of the correspondence view of truth. According to Hesse, traditional empiricism, with its firm dependence on the objectivity of facts, is challenged by the new trend in the philosophy of science, represented by Kuhn, Feyerabend, Tulming, and Quine. But this does not imply that empiricism must be abandoned. On the contrary, it seems possible to develop a different view, one that maintains certain basic assumptions of uh, empiricism, while showing that the more flexible view of the relationship between theory and facts can be beneficial even in the natural sciences. Hess's critique of the empiricist presuppositions is therefore aimed at an attempt to steer a course between scientific realism and instrumentalism, the goal that for her requires integration of natural science into a wider epistemological framework embracing the philosophy of social, social science, hermeneutics, and the sociology of knowledge. Now, the notion of hermeneutics is crucial to understanding what Hesse thinks natural science is or will become, according to an ideal of the integration of methodologies from other fields. The view that she expresses in her 1974 paper, In Defense of Objectivity, which is a discussion with, with the thesis from um, Habermas. Um, her view <clears throat> is that the sort of hermeneutic approach that one encounters in the social sciences can be found in the natural sciences as well. That is, she writes, a concern for knowledge as interpretation, sometimes explicitly distinguished from what is taken to be the direct, literal, uninterpreted modes of description proper to the natural uh, sciences. In her study, Hesse argues that the development of the history and philosophy of sciences of her time gradually led to dissatisfaction which, uh, with the logical empiricist accounts of the structure of science and with an overly sharp and largely unviable demarcation principle. As a result, Hesse argues that the imperialism previously claimed for natural science in the empiricist tradition has now turned in some quarters into its opposite, namely an assimilation of natural science itself into something approaching the hermeneutic critique. On this basis, Hesse provides an updated account of the natural sciences with the declared aim of showing that she writes almost every point traditionally made about the human sciences has recently been made about natural sciences. Whereas the empiricist view of the natural sciences that one encounters in the works of the critics of a scientific world description has nowadays been almost universally discredited. For Hesse, for example, the work of Wittgenstein, Quine, Kuhn, Feyerabend, and others has made it increasingly apparent that the descriptive language of observables is theory laden, laden and consequently a post-empiricist account of natural science can be outlined, uh, outlined as follows. This is uh, also an excerpt from, from the 1974 paper. First, in natural science, data is not detachable from theory, for what count as data are determined in the light of some theoretical interpretation and the facts themselves have to be reconstructed in light of interpretation. Second, in natural science, theories are not models externally compared to nature in a hypothetical deductive scheme. They are the way the facts themselves are seen. Third, in natural science, the law-like relations asserted of experience are internal because what counts as facts are constituted by what the theory says about their interrelations with one another. Four, four, the language of natural science is irreducibly metaphorical and inexact. 
and formalizable only at the cost of distortion of the historical dynamics of scientific development and of the imaginative constructions in terms of which nature is interpreted by science. And finally, fifth, meanings in natural science are determined by theory. They are understood by theoretical coherence rather than by correspondence with facts. Now, according to these five points, it is the very contraposition of facts and theory or interpretation that is problematized. The crucial point being that the object of scientific explanation is not a datum with which the observer must comply and that, and that must be justified passively. <coughs> On the contrary, Insofar as access to the facts available to scientific explanation depends on theoretical interpretation, it is possible to argue, uh, argue that an active and even constructive role pertains to theory, which is still based on an objective reality. This leads has to a new conception of scientific meaning based on a coherent theory of knowledge. Instead of searching for objectivity in the domain of facts, as the traditional correspondence theory recommends, we might explore the realm, on th the realm of theories. But this is only the first step for Hessel, for both solutions would seem to be unsatisfactory. Neither instrumentalism nor strong forms of scientific realism accommodate the full complexity of the theorizing process, which, she argues, involves a circular interpretation reinterpretation and self-correction of data in terms of, in terms of theory, theory in terms of data. As anticipated, her new epistemology aims to combine coherence and correspondence criteria of truth, which might be accomplished through the consensus theory she presents in um, her 1976 paper, Truth and the Growth of Scientific Knowledge. In this paper, Hesse explores the issue of truth and meaning as approached by the philosophy of language from the late uh, 1960s. She refers to Kuhn, Tarski, and Putnam in particular, with the aim or arg of arguing that it is possible to align a criterion of truth that allows for the translation of theoretical sentences in different language communities, and furthermore, justifies the historical fact that true sentences have accumulated independently of theoretical revolutions. Within this framework, Hesse outlines her consensus theory of truth, which depends not on the assumption of any privilege for the truth of the theoretical framework of our science, but rather, uh, writes Hesse, on the property of defining our science in terms of a certain category of observation sentences and a particular inferential method. The consensus theory is a theory of reference that is, writes Hesse, distinct from the traditional coherence and correspondence theories based on the minimal agreement that for a given language community, true observation sentences and correct application of a general observation terms are at least those that are reinforced as such by the consensus of the community. <clears throat> as his original observation is that more that mere consensus is implied by inclusion of the word observation in its specification. It does not follow in such a theory that everything that is agreed is true, nor that truth is wholly dependent on the language community. Such objections rest on a misunderstanding for the mechanics of language learning and reinforcement of correctness themselves depends on external reference of language. So it is not that uh, anything goes if agreed by the language community, but that the language community does or does not agree according to external constraints, defense has said. That a sentence like uh, that tree is green is not true because of a universally recognized extra linguistic greenness, but also not 
because there is a capricious and arbitrary agreement that the sentence should be true. This is also essence. So her conclusion is that consensus is uh, the way we have to learn, uh, the way we have learned or evolved to use our observational vocabulary. The philosophical issue as it aims to deal with in light of our consensus theory is that of the descriptive functions of uh, function of theories, starting from the idea that every scientific system implies a conceptual classification of the world into an ontology of fundamental entities and properties. And given that these ontologies are most subject to radical change throughout the history of science, S elaborates a conception of, of the growth, the growth of knowledge, not as a convergence of ontologies approximating better and better to a literal or direct description of the true essence of the world, but rather as an instrumental growth as pragmatic as our desire to have true controllable predictions. As to define this pragmatic accumulation of true observation sentences in the sense that we have better learned to find our way about in the natural environment and have a greater degree of predictive control over it. This is, however, unsatisfying for Hesse, for it leaves, it leaves unexplained how we can assess our theoretical sentences as true or objective, especially if they are not directly constrained by the external world. It is on this issue that the consensus theory can make the difference for her. Combined with a probability model, and she interprets this probability model uh, in an epistemological sense, as she writes, a rational or warranted degree of belief in the relevant scientific community that the sentence in question is true. So combined with this uh, probability model, the consensus theory allows us to maintain that the truth value of a theoretical sentence implies that there are entities and properties in the world as it describes them, as described by our theory. Therefore, as he argues that meaning is not given independently of observation constraint and purely by theoretical context. It is not a matter of instrumentalism, but is rather determined by the interplay between a theoretical and observational activity in a constructive sense that is fundamentally focused on the plane of actual scientific knowledge or description or explanation. Thus, we reach the core of a new epistemology that she aligns in a 1994 paper, How to be Postmodern Without Being a Feminist. Uh, her new epistemology is based on the idea that there is no ideal univocal language for science which can directly and unambiguously represent, uh, which, which can directly and unambiguously represent the world but also that a moderate realism of pragmatic success can be maintained. That epistemology stresses the metaphorical value of scientific language, but does not aim to leave behind the world's true state. On the contrary, S argues that acceptable theories do not need to be put forward as true in order to be pragmatically useful but they do tell a story about the world which captures some of its uh, structures and in that sense related to its true state. In agreement with those authors who undermine the fundamental presupposition of standard empiricism, Hesse is not interested in denying the very existence, existence of an underlying structure of the natural universe that science aims to discover in a set of true propositions constituting theories. Rather, she problematizes the idea that this structure can ever be accurately or completely known or represented in language. For although theories may be better or worse representations of the natural world, world <clears throat> none can ever be known to be definitely true. Thank you very much. <laughs>